the 16th century reformer in England, Thomas Cranmer, uh, he wrote the original Book of Common Prayer that's used in the Episcopal Church. He said that what the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. This understanding of humanity describes us as having internal structures and powers beyond our logical and conscious awareness. The mind isn't the part of us that just simply evaluates the data, analyzes the facts, and makes the decision in our best interest. To Cranmer, the mind is simply the linguistic center of our thinking. And so it uh, only gives voice to the deeper longings that are within us. In Cranmer's thinking, therefore, if a person is to know and follow God and live in the direction of God in Jesus, his heart must be turned to love God. Only the heart that loves God will choose the way of Jesus, and the mind will consistently evaluate and decide in that direction as well. This inside-out understanding of the human person contrasts almost directly with Rene Descartes, who comes some hundred years after Cranmer and the Protestant Reformation. Descartes is famous for his phrase, I think, therefore I am. His understanding of the human being is not that we begin with the heart, but with the mind. To be human is to be conscious of oneself and to have the ability to analyze and decide. Being itself is the mind. Descartes and his contemporaries and followers come to create what we now, looking back on it, call the Enlightenment. People like John Locke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Isaac Newton, Immanuel Kant, Thomas Jefferson. This way of seeing the world privileges the conscious mind and our mental faculties above all. It places human choices at the center of all of human endeavors. So the mind must be cultivated by education. The scientific method came to be a way of understanding the world with a sense of objectivity. Democracy is born from the Enlightenment. For a, a collective people who have the right information are together able to make the correct moral decisions for a society. But there is a response, a, a somewhat rejection of this rather antiseptic privileging of the mind over all parts of human life. Uh, we've come to call that movement Romanticism. Most of our knowledge of Romanticism comes from authors and composers, poets like Byron, Shelley, and Keats, the Bronte sisters with Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and others. And then there's those Romantic musicians who blurred the lines of the strict formulas of Bach, Beethoven, and Chopin, whose music was intended to play on the heart more than to delight the mind. So three periods of history, they overlap their intention, they inform one another. What the heart loves, the will chooses and the mind justifies. I think, therefore, I am. And to borrow the language of poet William Wordsworth, the powerful overflow of feeling. So why recount this sort of 300-year stretch of uh, European history? Um, because what we believe about the human being and our potential shapes how we structure a government, an economy, family lives, work incentives, educational systems, war, mores, and everything else. And there's been an interesting new chapter in this understanding of what it means to be human. It's come recently through the field of neuroscience. This is an Enlightenment-influenced field. It's a science. It privileges the collection and analysis of data to reach conclusions. 
But what the scientists have discovered as they've been scanning the brain in particular situations is that we are not fully independent agents of our own choices. What kind of traumas we experience as children. Veterans who have seen combat and people die in mass numbers before their eyes. Genetic predispositions that come from our parents. Affections for mentors and friends who have loved us and invested in us. Small subconscious effects through the media we consume and advertising. They all influence our brain chemistry so that we're really reacting more to stimuli than we are analyzing data and making rational choices. We're a compilation of family heritage, personal story, media consumption, neighborhood influence. So there really is no such thing as an independent individual. There is no absolutely free agent. So this study has brought us almost full circle. This enlightenment-influenced data of neuroscience has displayed empirically that the emotions, our feelings, have a far greater influence on our choices than we're aware of. And the mind is simply a justifier of those impulses and desires that occur beneath the level of consciousness. So maybe what the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. This belief that our heart can be shaped in a particular direction. It comes from the earliest days of Christianity. One of the contributions of our faith tradition to human history is the privileging of love as the motivator for life. But this is a self-giving, freely offered love that reflects the love of God that we've seen in the death and rising of Jesus. This expression of love is the hallmark of Christianity, not obedience to the Torah and our responsibility before God that grounded the faith of the Israelites out of which our movement is born, not fearful loyalty to the fickle gods of the pantheon who might or might not respond to the offerings that you make in their Roman temple. That's why we're in this sermon series. Love is the driving power that is declared out of the resurrection. It's a specific love, as we heard two weeks ago, love that goes through death in loyalty to us, a love that is always faithful. It's a love that looks for the other as its object instead of the self, as we said last week. And today we hear that it is love that comes from a heart directed by God. You heard that language in the short reading from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. Paul implores these Christians to remain steadfast in their faith, to keep spreading the good news of Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. He cautions them, don't be distracted or dismayed when others reject this new way of life and love. But then he says that he has confidence that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. Um, there's a tone of voice there. Y'all have heard it. It's when you're playing video games and your parent comes in and says, now I know you would have been, you're totally prepared for your biology test tomorrow before you would have ever thought of turning on that game console, right? You've heard that tone of voice. Yes, I have. Um, It's an assumption that they will continue to follow the commands that have been offered. Paul is hoping to get the same smile and nod and, and yes, ma'am, that, uh, that we all gave our parents. You're supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. But Paul has no pretense that the Thessalonians are going to continue following these commands of love because they've got the willpower and the mental analysis of the data to draw that love from them. No, he says, may the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. This is the power of God at work. God 
will direct our hearts. God's Spirit makes it possible for our hearts to love what God loves. So how does God do that? Well, it's different for all of us, really, but there are some consistent ways that we have seen our hearts be directed towards God's love beneath that level of consciousness. New Testament scholar Beverly Gaventa points out that in Paul's letters, he has little to say about humans loving God and much to say about God's love for human beings. So one way that our hearts become directed towards God's love is by the repetitious hearing that God loves us, that God loves you. You know how brain science has taught us that when a mother holds her baby to her breast, when she nurses the child, when a father rocks a child to sleep at night, the hormone oxytocin is released in both the baby's brain and on the parent's brain. That's the love hormone, the bonding hormone. To hear God loves you again and again is to be God's infant child at the breast to have our brains awash with that love hormone shaping our will and our mind. The heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. You know what else releases that love hormone, that bonding hormone, oxytocin? Singing. Singing together. Pair that physical bodily act of singing with a text and a tune that elicit memories of the past, and that heart begins to be shaped even more. Amazing grace, holy, 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 be thou my vision. Our breath catches in our throats, tears rise to our eyes. The wedding, the funeral, the baptism come roaring back. God is real and present. Our hearts directed in love. Two weeks ago, I got to lead the Wednesday communion service out in the columbarium. We hadn't met for several months. During that service, we typically have several prayers that we repeat every single week. And this was sort of a test to see if we still remembered them, having not done it for several months. Luckily, most of us uh, were able to recall them. They are printed, but you sort of learn them as you say them over and over again. Eternal God, you've so greatly loved us, long sought us, and mercifully redeemed us. There it is, said and heard, repeated again and again, as God directs our hearts towards love. Same thing happens here. We say the Lord's Prayer week after week, a vocalized prayer directing our hearts to see as God sees and live the way Jesus lives. But that same intentional life of prayer, it can happen Solo, too, as you sit on the front steps, as you watch the sunrise, holding a cup of coffee in the morning, holding hands around the dinner table before a meal, thank you for the earth so sweet, thank you for the food we eat. None of this stuff is conscious choosing of the mind. It's beyond a trusting of our feelings. Sometimes you don't feel like saying your prayers. Sometimes you don't feel like singing. Yeah, this is beyond that. It's the deep subconscious where the Holy Spirit works. Then we have the Eucharist, bread and wine. We watch them broken and poured, words repeated each month. The tray passed her to come forward and receive the elements, physical embodiment, material elements, hearts directed in love. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens. I'll give you rest. Now, you've put the pieces together. All these things I've been describing, they are communal acts of worship. A regular reminder of God's grace and love for us. You hear it every week. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. 
singing praises and doxology to God joined together, prayers repeated, heard, experienced a holy meal in bread and cup, physical acts held together in common space with visual symbols and lifetimes of memory. We've been grateful over these past 13 months for the ways that technology has been able to keep us connected to each other. But to ponder God with the mind while folding laundry during the worship service, yes, I have been at your house, (laughs) that's an enlightenment engagement. It's about thinking. To wait until 11.15 turn on the live stream just to catch the sermon, cut it off. That's an enlightenment thing again. That's worship for the sake of gaining information that will somehow change me. Don't think that the sermon works that way. Yeah, it takes us being together to try to draw on our own willpower to make us holy just going to keep us stuck in works righteousness, make us think that I have the responsibility within me to practice the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Like, listen, you can't white-knuckle your way through Christian faith. You can't just be like, I'm going to be good. Our wills aren't that strong. That's why Torah observance didn't work. Only the heart, beneath the level of consciousness. And that heart is shaped by our common life, our embodied life, in regular worship with each other, in ritual and word. I know we're still wearing masks. I know we've still got socially distanced seating. We're going to have more seating available at the end of May. Till then, we still have two services each week. Many in our congregation are vaccinated. We've heard reports that you don't really pick up COVID by touching different surfaces. It's time to come back to worship. Young and old, babies, we got a nursery, teenagers, it's time to get back. This is where our hearts are directed in the love of God. This is the promised place. Here is where we receive the perseverance of Christ. If you're feeling exhausted, here's a place where you don't have to buckle up and buckle down anymore. You receive Christ's perseverance. This is where and how we're shaped. Not by our ideas or by our fortitude, but by God's gift of love quietly, consistently, reliably forms us and moves us and makes us in ways that we understand and in a whole lot more ways that we're never really going to understand. Makes us into a people of grace. Amen.